Well, thank you very much. Uh, always an honor to get to be part of OIS. Uh, certainly uh, so good to see so many people here as this is really still the initiation of this within optometry with SECO. And SECO's obviously had been a terrific partner, uh, obviously very innovative in of themselves. In fact, if you think about a lot of the prescribing rights that occurred in the United States, it really started in the Southeast, which is what, of course, the Southeast Council of Optometry. And so I think that's carried a lot. And we were trying to find perhaps the best meetings, working with Craig, and, and he's done this so successfully for, for such a long time now in other fields like retina and ophthalmology, et cetera, it, it really became the, the right choice. And so it's, a, it's an honor to get to be here. I'm pleased with the program we've put together. Hopefully you guys will get a lot of insights. But I decided, compared to the last time we did this uh, at, at SECO, was to really shift it a little bit into a better understanding of optometry. I felt like that was going to be a critical step for companies to be able to succeed, even though we have a good mix of companies, uh, investors, and even, uh, and of course, optometrists are my colleagues here. So I'm going to pass this. We're going to really go into innovation and, and have you think of it in a very different way as our initiation. Then we'll get and we'll bring up Dr. Nichols, who will chair up the, uh, the, the dry eye and, and that ocular surface section, which will be very interesting. But this is an interesting fact. The number is actually about 87% of all pro comprehensive eye exams are performed by optometry. So if you've got a drug that you're working on or a device or a diagnostic, you gotta take that into account in, in terms of recognizing that nine out of 10 comprehensive exams go through a primary eye care optometrist uh, in that setting or, or any optometrist for that. So that really changes a lot of our, our understanding. It's the fastest growing profession in terms of prescribing, but not just in eye care, all the medicine, if you look at the statistics um, over time. Estimated growth is about 11% per year over about the last six years. Uh, all 50 states, and most optometrists know this, but not all of industry knows this, all 50 states currently have topical ocular medications. 49 allow for oral medications. We now have 10 states that have advanced uh, procedures and lasers, uh, surgical uh, privileges. So I think that helps a lot as kind of setting the stage for where we are today, meaning that if we're going to be doing more of those things, we're obviously going to be doing more medical as well. And this last line is kind of interesting. Optometry surpassed ophthalmology prescribing in all categories. And of course, there's an asterisk there because it doesn't include perioperative medications or retinal injections outside of those two areas as well. And glaucoma is the other one where it hasn't surpassed, but it's been responsible for a lot of the growth over time. These are some good examples. 75% of all presbyopia drugs, and I know that was the first launch of a presbyopia drop. We're only going to see that increasing. In fact, at one point, it was close to 80% of the prescriptions were from optometry. Uh, you know, going back to Inspire, you know, they were one of the first companies, and there's actually many of the people who are responsible for that are here, uh, who really kind of realized the importance of, of equalizing things, making as many optometrists in their education as ophthalmologists, same number of medical advisors in optometry as in ophthalmology, a lead uh, OD and a lead MD. And, and they ended up with 68% of their prescriptions at the hiatus coming from optometry. So it just gives you an example that you don't have to do more, even though that's going to be your larger market. You just have to be able to show that you've got that ability to focus on both groups. And the last statistic's interesting, that for about a decade, it's been responsible for close to 100% of the growth in certain categories that are much more established. So why the trend? Well, part of it's a little bit of just the demographics out there, to be fair. There's just not enough cataract surgeons. Uh, in fact, if you looked at the last presentation that I, I, I got to hear about this um, at one of the ophthalmology meetings, they basically said that there's not more cataracts being done. You'd think that means there's less cataract patients out there. It's not the case. It's the backlog has increased by about 40%. So that's pretty fascinating that all we're doing is getting further behind and at some point, I mean, I've never had an interview with a surgeon, a good cataract surgeon, and say, would you rather do surgery or dry eye? Ever to say they'd rather do dry eye. So it, it's kind of where we are in terms of this. The average wait times have gone up by 20%. Uh, it's not stable long term. It means optometry has to do more medical. So part of it is better education, great meetings like this, SECO and others. And it's also that the, the training at schools has come to a whole other level. But the demographics have also said this is the only way the care is going to be provided is likely through optometry in those disease categories. So if you have, you know, even 2023 is going to be a blockbuster year for, for these companies and for the industry as a whole. If you think about things like AI are still developing, uh, you know, virtual reality headsets are starting to take off, or at least they're showing a lot of interest. We have a review of optometry where I'm the chief medical editor. We have a survey that goes out, and I was fascinated to see that the second most sought after thing after OCT was virtual reality 
headsets and things along those lines, including in AMD, included in glaucoma. OCT is pretty much mainstream now across the board, wide field, the same sort of thing. But my point to this is if you look at, you know, you have to really focus on the entire disease state if you're going to be successful. OCT was not successful just because they had something new. They had to be able to teach glaucoma and retina with it. And that becomes very important as you're launching products in those categories. And then you also have to uncover something that most docs can't say, oh, I can find that answer another way, because it'll take the easier route in optometry and ophthalmology when it comes to, hey, if I could find it another way that doesn't cost me a lot, I'm gonna make the diagnosis that way. But look at this year. We have two GA drugs, one already got an approval, one likely to be approved very soon with great data as well. It's the first time we've ever had anything for dry AMD. Now, of course, those are injections, but Estimates say as many as 80% of those patients are in optometric offices. Three dry eye drugs potentially this year. That's quite amazing. Uh, one in blepharitis, uh, Demodex specifically, one in presbyopia towards the end of the year. Then as you mentioned, about 80% of those patients still apply. This is one of my favorite graphs, the Gartner scale. Many of the people who are in industry have seen this many times. But it's kind of this understanding of where innovation gets to. And since we're at the OIS, it's, it's a good fit. You start with a trigger, something exciting. Maybe it's geographic atrophy, since we've never had anything for that, or earlier days in dry eye. And then you hit this peak of inflated expectations. And optometry and ophthalmology all get excited and think, this is where I want to be. And then they try to do it, and you get into the trough of disillusionment. Part of the reason for that, though, is that so many times companies use their widget as their sale. I've got this device, I've got this drug, it's the magic bullet, it's the solution to everything. And that's not how it works in clinical practice. Your widget has to be within the disease state. You have to understand how it applies, what it means, how it makes my life easier within dry eye, within geographic atrophy, within glaucoma. And if you look at the, then you, then you dig yourself out and you start to get success and where you're at. And so I decided to plot a few of these on here. So blepharitis, I, I would have put a higher up there like Demodex, but when I look at some of the chat rooms and I look at some of the talks and stuff, I realize we are just barely understanding blepharitis at all. So it's really at the very bottom. It should be much higher by now. And, and the companies that are gonna have a drug for Demodex are doing a phenomenal job, I have to admit, better than I've seen in decades. And yet we're just barely moving the needle. And that's how much work they still gotta do before their approval. You look at DME and other things a little higher because companies like Regeneron have done a good job in that area as well. Geographic atrophy, yeah, there's quite a bit more awareness than I expected, but no one knows what to do with it or what to expect. Look where presbyopia is. It went through the peak of inflated expectations, and now it's in the trough of disillusionment. So anything there is to come out of it. But if that's a better place to be than during the hype cycle. It actually is. You're better to have gotten through that and start working properly out of it than you are going up the hype cycle and then failing. Uh, AMD also, as a whole, had some issues, and GA may help that a little bit. Dry eyes in that slope of enlightenment. Doctors are starting to understand where things fit in, getting more success, and that's only going to continue to grow dramatically. Glaucoma is way past that because of really good teachers and understanding the disease and societies that have done that in optometry. The, most people who get really into glaucoma, even though it might be only be about 20% of the profession, really feel confident, have grown it, have done very well in it. And that's a, just an idea of where you approach. You could pretty much plot out your technology in amongst those. So devices and diagnostics, will they have to uncover something a doctor can't think they can find easily. That's going to be real important to your success. Now, there is a fear of missing out. Wide field uh, as technology actually did really well because people thought I might miss a retinal tear and I'm not good at looking in the peripheral retina with my current technologies. And that fear of missing something is what really drove it. Same thing with retinal nerve fiber layers when it comes to, to glaucoma and thinning in that area. It is KOL intensive. Optometry trusts their key opinion leaders. In fact, they don't want to read a white paper you've published, but they expect the people who are key opinion leaders, most of them in here, uh, read the paper and can translate it. That's the way it works in optometry. They, they, don't, they don't have the time to spend reading research papers, but they do expect that the people that are teaching have read them and that can convey that in a good, easy way. And that, of course, makes it easier to master. You must teach the entity, not just your product, not just your widget. Uh, laser advanced procedures are going to beckon easier procedures so that more doctors can do it as well. Therapeutics have to identify an ideal candidate. In fact, when I looked at some of the research of where products didn't succeed, they've never identified their key candidate. I presented this this past summer in a, in a little paper. And, uh, and I put a lot more statistics behind it, but I was fascinated how if you look at companies that could find the best patient, they're always more successful, whether it was an IOL or whether it was a dry eye product, than companies that could not identify who the best candidate is. And they go to an even higher level when they can teach doctors easily who's not a good candidate. 
A lot of companies think the mechanism of action, the videos that show how it works, the science behind it are so important. Actually, if you look at some of the research around, uh, this is not, this is independent research done, Jobson and others, they actually, most doctors say, I just want that checkbox. I want to know that you know the science, but I don't really want to get into it. I just want to know that you've checked that box off. So don't spend a lot of time on it, but make sure you understand how your drug basically works. And you know what, I do that with my patients. They want to know how an IPL or something works, but they want to know that I know there's science behind it. And if I just take a few seconds to explain it, it works and it goes really far. Also consider options. If you have an injection like for GA, is it possible you can have an oral? where you have 49 states that can prescribe it by optometrist, or a topical where all 50 can prescribe it. So that becomes important. Uh, and then you also have to look at how you set things up. If you have an optometric target, meaning you're, you've got a dry drug, a blepharitis drug, an ocular surface drug, a, a device in those categories, optometry should be your primary provider for all the reasons we talked about, your number one prescriber, your number one user. So you gotta look at that, balance it out. I mean, I looked at webinars on some of these Oh, these products are very optometric driven and they had twice as many MDs on the panel as ODs and that's okay if it's a surgical or if it's a even glaucoma to some extent balancing those out but really you want to look at where you're at. Your advisory board should be similar. If you have a chief medical advisor and it's an optometric primarily focused ocular service product, make sure that's not only an MD. Make sure that you have a way that the profession perceives that hey they're behind optometry too. And they have to contribute of course. MD speaker training to ODs, not so much. We don't know the top MDs. Um, some of us do, but not as a whole. But we know the top ODs, and that's who we're going to listen to. One company decided to do direct consumer before educating the provider that's going to see these patients. Guess where that went? They showed up, and the patient doctor said, I don't even know what this is. It never went anywhere, because the doctor will discourage any patient from using anything if they don't understand it. You've got to identify the ideal candidate and what to expect with these drugs. We talked about companies that get it that have done really well. Rx Sight. LDD laser device after putting in a uh, light adjustable lens. The majority assert these LDDs, these laser procedures, are actually done by optometrists in ophthalmology practices. We talked about Zydra's success. Prior to that, it was actually Inspire with Azacite that had more prescriptions from optometry than ophthalmology. GA companies have programs in place. I admire that. They're really already starting with educating the profession really well. But here's the facts. 43,000 optometrists to 18,000 ophthalmologists. 14,000 high prescribers. 18 to 24,000 say they want to prescribe, they're prescribing at least on a regular basis. One big factor is vision insurance. That makes it difficult for that's why you don't see 43,000 saying they're doing this. And optometrists are not only ECPs, but they're patient advocates. I'll show you a really quick, now this isn't fair. I took a section of a survey to emphasize a point. You never want to take part of your data. That's not even scientific. But I looked at these few questions. There were questions directed to an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and a patient. So if it's something like, if this was a very expensive drug to you, but it worked really well for your condition, would you prescribe it or would you use it? It was reworded for the patient. And what you saw across the graph is how close optometry was to the patient. It was almost like an advocate. So if you're designing your market strategy in optometry, it might be very similar to what you target for the patient, the direct consumer, because they're going to tie in. They're going to look for adverse events. They're going to look for the success. They're going to look for how easy this device is on the patient, what it costs the patient. They look at those things much more than any other profession I know of. We're highly influenced by KOLs. We're more influenced in the first three to five years out of optometry school than we are after five years never understood this. I've had residents go to my program. I feel like when they finish a program in my clinic, they're going to have some of the best knowledge, especially in ocular surface disease. They join a practice who does none of that. And I thought, well, why don't you share your knowledge and change it? Say, well, this is the way the practice works. So that started to change, thanks to good leaders in education. But they're still more influenced in those first three years. That's why doctors who do residencies in optometry do much more medical, because they're influenced in that first critical time. Podium still number one modifier. What's really interesting is that most optometrists, 90%, say they still would rather read a journal than go online, probably because there's a lot there. Second thing they say is they actually prefer online for social and less for education. They'd rather talk amongst other doctors on an ODs and Facebook about everything, including some, but not get education in those monetics. And then they also see CE as a way to get credits without having to learn anything online. I don't want to put down online. It's been something that's saved us for a while, but that's what most of the surveys end up showing. That it's important to have some there but you're not going to get the same impact as a live workshop, doctors present, learning interactive and present for that. You have to have both. 
sense of belonging is critical. Optometry really likes to be part of their societies, part of their groups, part of their organizations. Keep that in mind as you're figuring out how to do your strategy. Study groups used to be actually that decades ago. So optometry has been like that from the beginning of its profession. But that's why pr private equity did so well in so many areas, because doctors felt, hey, I can join this group in advance. And so did other alliances, et cetera. So finally, find focused ways and to ride this trend. Optometry is the fastest prescribing and medical providing eye care provider currently. And it's only going to continue to grow because we don't have enough surgeons to, to take care of the population that's out there. And surgeons want to do surgery. You have to be perceived as neutral to both professions. This is not, hey, let's focus on optometry, but make sure you're perceived as, hey, we're behind both to make sure that they're both educated well. And if you incorporate these learnings, of which you're going to get a lot of today as you do your presentations and you get your feedbacks from all of these different experts within it, and or you're relaunching a product, such as a device or a diagnostic motivator, put these in place, and I guarantee you're probably going to see some success because a lot of this came from directly from the profession who was so willing to give a lot of information out. 